Hi everyone, so we're going to just get started here. Um, I'm just going to go through a few just logistics for the webinar first. Um, we're going to distribute the webinar directly after the presentation. If you need any technical help with the webinar, you'll see the link there below, support.citrixonline.com um, slash webinar. If you guys want to join the conversation on Twitter and share some of the insights and data points that we present today, um, you see our Twitter handles there, at KPMG, at CB Insights, and we're using hashtag FinTech today. Um, so today's webinar, as you guys are aware, we will be talking about sort of the pulse of fintech, looking at a comprehensive sort of review of 2015, as well as sort of what we're seeing in the early uh, stages of 2016. So we'll be taking a data-driven look at all the investment trends, companies, as well as investors in, in fintech globally. Just a quick bit about KPMG. Um, I'm going to let sort of Warren and Joe later introduce themselves, as well as um, sort of speak to, to KPMG. But we partnered with KPMG. Um, with a sort of fintech report uh, that we just put out last week. Um, a lot of the data points and slides will be from that report and we'll be sort of putting those in context today. Uh, but excited to get this partnership underway with KPMG and and, um, and excited to present uh, sort of the array of fintech activity happening globally with them. Um, just quickly about CB Insights. Um, we're backed by RSTP and the National Science Foundation and broadly using data science and machine learning to help our customers predict what's next, their next customer, next investment, the next market they should be attacking, the next move of their competitor. Um, here are just a few of our customers who are um, uh, allowed us to sort of uh, share what they had to say about us, and you can see the link there, cbinsights.com slash customer love. Um, so the, the mantra that we sort of run through here at CB Insights um, is, in God we trust, all others must bring data. So we're trying to really sort of avoid a lot of the punditry, a lot of the um, sort of talking points that are out there and really put a data-driven uh, perspective on, um, in this case, FinTech. Um, so in the next 35 to 45 minutes, we're going to cover five main areas here. One is we're going to spotlight sort of the emerging activity in blockchain. Um, we're going to look at sort of FinTech trends globally, and then we'll dive into a few of the geographic segments, North America, Europe, and Asia, and look through some of the investment and startup trends in each of those regions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Warren Mead. He's global partner and co-leader of the fintech practice at KPMG. Um, Warren, take it away. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome from myself and all of my colleagues at KPMG to the first of these fintech events together with CB Insights. Um, we're going to be doing these quarterly, so I hope you'll be able to join us on the journey. Uh, at KPMG, we really believe we're market leaders in fintech. We uh, have eight fintech hubs around the world, as far as far abroad as uh, Australia, the UK, Luxembourg, Israel, the US, etc. Um, and we're really proud of the work that we do with clients to help them both with their strategy, how on earth do I do this phenomenon of fintech, um, and then more operationally, how do I go about executing on the opportunity, how do I partner? There are obviously huge sums of money that have gone into fintech in the last 12 months, as the report shows. Um, and so for us, it's really important to help our clients understand how much of that is hype and how much of that is reality, and how much of it is froth, and where the substance is. Um, and you know that applies across all areas uh, and all components of fintech, but not least, uh, blockchain, and that's why we decided to spotlight blockchain in this first of our fintech reports. So with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague and partner, Joe Cassidy. Joe is our global market leader um, for infrastructure in banking and financial services. So Joe, delighted to hear from you. Over to you. Thanks, Warren, and uh, hello to everybody, and thank you for joining. Um, I'm, I'm going to cover off some of the practitioner views of uh, blockchain. So uh, trying, to, trying to cut through, as Warren said, what's hype and what's reality and what, what's froth and what's not. Uh, and on slides 12 and 13, you've got some color and background on, on the investment that's taken place in blockchain. It, it, it's not a complete picture, it's fair to say, because it's really looking at the VC side of things rather than necessarily what's going in from principal investment groups in banks and organizations and the way that they're viewing it. Uh, 
but you'll see that there is a, a degree of plateauing um, and you'll also see that some of the organizations concerned are, are reaching the, the next rounds of, uh, of investment. What we're, what we're really seeing though is um, a significant amount of people experimenting with the technology at this moment in time and, and, and not really using it in core mission critical systems and infrastructure on, on a broader basis. And, and that's quite natural for a new technology when it comes along because generally you need a consistent level of adoption through value chains, be they in securities processing or post-trade servicing or even in payments where a number of people need to be able to access a common version of, of technology in order for it to make a difference. The, the question that a lot of people have got on blockchain still is what problems is it actually solving for or is it a solution looking for a problem uh, to solve? And, and what distinctive characteristics does it bring to the table, be they cost efficiency, uh, new levels of standardization that existing technologies do not provide for. So a lot of our clients are, are looking at these technologies and saying, okay, uh, it, may, it may be able to solve for this specific area and it could be in settlement risk or delivery risk or it could be in uh, digital identity, but, but does it bring something to the table over and above what we've currently got access to. The second, the second thing people are looking at, and, and very much this is true for chief investment officers or chief technology officers, is whilst they want to be able to experiment with the technology, are they prepared to take a risk with it in a live production mission critical environment? Uh, and the answer uh, for mainstream processing at this moment in time is that that is limited. Uh, it's it's not a pervasive uh, technology that's starting to be used because there's a lot of standardization still required and there's a, there's a maturity curve for the technology to go through before people can really trust it with those mission critical systems. The other interesting thing is that people focus on, on the technology itself a lot and very often what we find with uh, the adoption of new technologies is that it, it needs to be aligned to recognition in other ways. So uh, if you take distributed ledgers for, for the sake of argument on a cross-jurisdictional basis, uh, can they support the multiple legal uh, infrastructures that they have to be able to support uh, and, and that legal opinion and indeed the uh, multiple accounting treatments, are they something that can be adopted within the technology as well? So there's still uh, an element there of of the stars needed to join up, not just technology, but from a legal and a regulatory perspective, and then the view from, from within. Another key issue is still the, the, the question of where this sits as a, as a matter of priority. What we're seeing is that the agenda um, at board level within many of the financial services organizations has been driven by regulatory litigation issues uh, and increasingly the cost of the business model. So when we look at these new technologies and their, and their ability to, uh, to be adopted and deployed and solve for real business problems, we ask whether or not they're solving for, uh, for some of those areas and that's where 80 to 90 percent of the spend over the last five to seven years in major financial services organizations has actually been. If you throw in in addition to that uh, the cyber question and, and cyber security. So how does blockchain sit in relation to the, those other areas? Does it, does it reduce the cost of servicing businesses as much as somebody moving into the public cloud for the sake of argument uh, and the power that that can bring uh, to those organizations? Now having said all of that, um, we do feel that there are a couple of areas that, uh, in, in particular, where we, we see uh, some, some opportunity and traction. So moving away from a lot of the coverage that's taken place, be it with um, the securities processing model, uh, we, 
we feel that the question of digital identity and the possibilities uh, for distributed or even centralized uh, ledgers using uh, chain technologies and um, and consensual protocols has got some real value in in the digital identity arena. The, the solvency model, the resolution and solvency models of the banks in multiple jurisdictions require that they have the ability to provide for continuity of service to their client base. And, and we see possibilities within uh, the blockchain technologies for solving for this particular area uh, and increasing the speed of porting customers from, from one institution to another. We also see the question of KYC, the know your client prerogative, um, being potentially able to leverage these technologies as well. Again, going back to uh, the ability to pour people easily from one place to another and share the cost, particularly on low risk clients, of remediation and uh, servicing clients through KYC regulation. The other and final area is uh, the question of insurance and lending, which, which people have, have focused on more recently around smart contracts. There, there, is, uh, there, there are certain markets which are uh, small in scale um, in, in terms of number of counterparties and, and the volume that goes through, but significant in notional terms, where historical uh, paper-based environments are still supported. Uh, and in those opaque markets, we see the possibility of chain uh, technologies having a, a significant impact, um, as well as in uh, specialized lending, i.e. The, the low volume market where the characteristics of, of the product require a number of different updates to the, the actual product set, and, and again, the technology lends itself naturally to uh, to quite an opaque market. So, so that's our, that's kind of our summary at this moment in time of where things are. Matt, I was going to hand back to you. Um, so you can take questions at the appropriate point. Great, thanks. And I'm just going to mention that Joel will be around at the end of the webinar to answer any questions you guys have about blockchain. So feel free to submit all of those. Um, so next, and apologies in advance if we're going, going to go through this very quickly, but we're going to look first at sort of global macro trends um, within fintech. So what do we cover in fintech, right? So here are eight of the, the main areas or thematic areas that um, fintech is now encompassing. So lending, payments, personal finance, and as well as asset and wealth management, money transfer and remittances, blockchain, distributed ledger, capital markets, crowdfunding, as well as now we're seeing a, a lot more activity in the insurance sector, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Um, so just, you know, at a macro level, 2015 saw sort of a record amount of money into fintech startups, so $13.8 billion into venture capital-backed fintech startups across over 650 deals. If you look at that on a year-over-year -year basis, um, venture-backed companies actually take just a portion of the overall amount of funding to fintech. So if you think about all the investments coming from angel groups, angel investors, PE firms, as well as hedge funds and mutual funds and others, um, the grant total is actually much larger than uh, than just the VC-backed VC portion, but for the purposes of this webinar, we're going to focus uh, mainly on the companies that have taken venture funding. Um, here, you'll see that sort of annual number as it reflects for venture funding um, into fintech startups. So 2015 topping sort of the 2014 total by over 100%. Um, deal, activity also, deal activity also up um, compared to 2014 and, and way up compared to just five years ago. Um, but when we take a little bit more of a nuanced view and, and break down sort of this funding activity by quarter, what we see is that actually fintech funding did drop significantly in Q4, um, as well as deal activity. So, um, you know, that is in line with sort of the broader slowdown we are seeing in sort of the venture capital markets. We're seeing um, less investments as well as deal activity into the sort of venture-backed uh, category as a whole, and fintech is definitely no exception to that. So after we saw several big mega rounds in Q3, as well, including SoFi, um, so marketplace lender here in the U.S., which raised over a billion dollars in the financing round, that really cooled down in Q4, and we saw, you know, activities not seen since um, 2014 um, and earlier. Um, so definitely a trend to keep in mind heading into 2016. 
one of the big reasons why we did see sort of the um, influx of funding into fintech, though, as a whole in 2015 are these so-called mega rounds, right? So this chart here shows sort of the influx of $50 million financings to VC-backed fintech companies um, by geography. And you see there um, North America and Asia both increasing significantly, as well as Europe, uh, increasing significantly in terms of these $50 million financing rounds uh, to fintech from just a few years ago when we are seeing um, less than five in total across the three major geographies. So these sort of giant rounds coming from um, a number of different investors, which we'll touch on later, um, is driving sort of the influx of funding into the category. And one of the main sort of participants now in this sort of fintech ecosystem is the rise of corporations. Um, so if we look at sort of the past three quarters uh, from a deals perspective in fintech, um, corporations as well as their venture arms are taking now almost one-fourth of all deal activity or participating in one-fourth of all deal activity within the fintech space. Um, so that's a significant change from uh, just a few years back. And what we're seeing this come not just from um, tech investors, but, but also sort of financial services firms as well. Um, what all this is doing is sort of creating um, a segment of very well-funded and also highly valuable companies in the private markets in the fintech sector. So when we look globally, there's now 19 companies um, that are valued at over $1 billion, these so-called unicorn companies within the fintech sector. Most of the companies thus far have actually been centered in the, fin the payments as well as lending tech spaces. But we are seeing others now emerge. So insurance, we see a couple of firms there, Zenefits as well as Zongan Insurance, which is an online PNC insurer in China. Um, and what are the other areas now that will sort of grow with fintech? Um, blockchain is one of them where we are anticipate more activity. But um, here you see sort of that breakdown of billion dollar companies where most of the value has been accrued thus far. And you see payments and lending uh, taking the majority of that. When we look at sort of the individual funding breakdowns for these main spaces, so payments, um, did see also a slowdown in Q4, as we mentioned, with fintech um, after several quarters where funding either touched or, or was close to sort of a billion dollars overall. You see some of the sort of major deals there on the left, uh, sorry, on the right, uh, Affirm and Zora, which is a bill pay company here in the U.S., uh, 197 in India, which is focusing on mobile wallets and payments. Um, and then when we look at sort of the lending space, um, this was a sector that we you could probably count um, on, on two hands a number of companies back uh, prior to 2008 who were in this marketplace lender. That's when we saw sort of On Deck Capital and Lending Club, two of the early companies in the space that have since IPO'd, um, basically be founded or start up. Um, and here now you see sort of the, the last five quarters of activity. UDC, UDC um, some of the mega rounds continuing. You mentioned SoFi's round in Q3, but we did see again a drop off in Q4. Um, if you were on sort of on deck capitals lend, uh, earnings call a, a short while back, you know they, they mentioned that they um, anticipate that we're sort of in the latter days of company formation in the lending space. Um, and while we do see activity, we, we definitely um, anticipate that lending is sort of changing as a category um, from sort of early marketplace lenders to now you're seeing a lot more activity around infrastructure, um, data, and other applications. Um, insurance, which we mentioned earlier, is, is an area where we are seeing a lot more activity within the fintech space, and that's certainly bearing out at the early stage. So if you look at just the seed and Series A activity in, fintech, in the insurance space, um, we're seeing sort of quarterly highs uh, in the last two quarters. Um, if you look at you know seed rounds, um, just seed rounds, we did a recent analysis of the largest sort of seed rounds in the technology sector, and both of them actually went to um, insurance tech startups in the la in the last five quarters. Um, so insurance is certainly an area we expect to, to see grow, and, and most of the activity and, and the excitement is at the early stages uh, where we're seeing sort of a, a hotbed of activity. When we look at uh, sort of exits, uh, we, we did see an influx of M&A in the, in the first few quarters of, of 2015, but uh, you know exits have also dropped. Um, and, it's, and if you think about sort of the largest fintech exits uh, to date, most of those, uh, you know, Square being the sort of the exception in Q4, Lending Club and OnDeck were, were both in, in 2014, and we haven't seen that many large exits. It's sort of been a knock on, on the fintech sector is sort of this lack of, of major uh, fintech exits despite sort of the entrance of a lot of financial services firms into this sort of investment of these companies. Um, 
you know, one thing we also have seen is some, since those companies have gone public, sort of fintech's most exciting exited companies, um, they have sort of underperformed the S&P 500. So this is a chart looking at sort of the stock performance of, of Onda Capital, Lending Club, and Square, um, all of them sort of underperforming the S&P since their IPOs. Uh, we're going to use this tool a bit uh, throughout the presentation. There's a tool here at CB Insights called the Business Social Graph to visualize investments, acquisitions, um, competitive par uh, competitors as well as partnerships um, throughout the ecosystem. So we'll be using this tool sort of to map different players in the space. And one application of that Business Social Graph is here looking at uh, the number of fintech investors over time. So if you look at 2010, um, there were just over 200 investors in fintech startups that includes VCs, angels hedge funds and other investor types. Um, but if we fast forward to 2016, we see now there's over 900 different investors in the fintech ecosystem. So clearly just enormous growth in terms of the number of investors in the fintech ecosystem. And it's not just VC investors, it's sort of spanning across corporates, including sort of non-financial services corporations. So here we look at Google, Intel and Salesforce, who are all doing a number of deals in the fintech space. Google Ventures is actually among the most active investors overall in fintech, um, investing in companies across the lending, uh, personal savings, as well as stock trading apps like Robinhood. Um, and then you see Intel and Salesforce. Salesforce actually just recently invested in an uh, insurance tech startup there on the right, Finance Fox. And it's not just here in the US, it's also in Asia. So here we see um, a few of the global corporations who are also interested in fintech. I mentioned SoftBanks um, earlier mega investment into uh, marketplace lender SoFi, but you also see a few others. Renrin has been notably active, um, the Chinese uh, social networking uh, company, which has invested in Motif, SoFi, Lending Home, and others. Um, you see Ping'an Ventures, which is the venture arm of um, insurance carrier Ping'an in China. One that's not, also not on here, um, but is notable is Rakuten in, in Japan, it's sort of the big um, e-commerce corporation, which uh, just devoted a portion of um, funds into uh, investing solely in fintech. Um, here, of course, we see that it's also hitting the banks now. So major banks um, are not sitting on the sidelines and are also investing directly into the space. So when we look at sort of the um, different uh, banks who are invested into venture-backed fintech companies, that includes um, the big names like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, um, and then Citigroup, which has been highly active through its uh, corporate venture arm, City Ventures. And you see a host of the other banks there who are getting involved now, Wells Fargo and Morgan Stanley, um, as well as others. Here we'll take a closer look at JP Morgan, and you see sort of where their um, core investments have fallen within the different thematic categories within fintech. So um, they invested in Square prior to its IPO. Um, in the marketplace lending space, they've invested in Prosper, and now also investing into blockchain startups. Um, such as digital asset holdings, as well as uh, the R3CEV partnership between banks to um, find ways where sort of blockchain can can apply um, in sort of bank contexts. So when we look at Goldman Sachs, we see Goldman a bit more active than JP Morgan on the fintech front, but also placing bets uh, throughout these sort of thematic categories that have come about within fintech, um, including personal finance management, lending, and blockchain, of course. Uh, Goldman made sort of an earlier investment into uh, the space with an investment into Circle Finance last year. Um, it's a payments company which integrated Bitcoin. Um, and you see here sort of the number of different bets. They also um, notably have invested in a number of sort of big data applications within fintech. So Kenshu is one company in Cambridge that they invested in earlier. Um, and you see a host of others there as well. Um, what this sort of means is that sort of the reason why a lot of corporations and banks included are investing in, in the fintech space is because of sort of the just the sheer number of companies that are targeting the individual applications um, within banks. So here we you see sort of a graphic that we put together um, called Unbundling of a Bank, where you see all the different startups that are targeting sort of the individual um, service lines of, of a bank, not sort of going after the bank as a whole, but just picking off sort of the small uh, relationships that banks once had directly with their customers. Um, and that's not just in the US, but also in Asia, where we see a host of other start, uh, also in Europe, where we see a host of other startups who have um, emerged um, in Europe and internationally to um, also focus on sort of attacking the individual pieces of a bank uh, through sort of new data driven and better UIs in terms of uh, financial services tech. Um, of course, sort of financial services incumbents haven't sort of sat on the sidelines. So, uh, here you see four of the ways where they've actively sort of made a uh, made moves, whether that's investments. We mentioned sort of the major bank investments into VC-backed 
fintech companies, partnerships. Um, some of the notable ones that we've seen over time include Lending Club and City, as well as JP Morgan and On Deck Capital in the lending space. Um, and then a number of acquisitions. So that's happening sort of across um, different areas of fintech, both um, as it pertains to sort of wealth management, um, bill pay, and, and other sort of consumer facing um, areas. Um, so some of the acquisitions there include sort of Honest Dollar, which was acquired by Goldman Sachs um, just, just last week, as well as a few others like LearnVest, um, as well as Check, which were acquired by Northwestern Mutual and, um, and Intuit. Um, and then and lastly, you see sort of startups who are also um, directly now going and competing with um, large corporations. So incumbents aren't afraid to fight back and actually respond directly to them, as you see there in a response by Charles Schwab to uh, the robo-advisor Wealthfront. Um, and so when we look at sort of where the, the, the bulk of funding is really increasing, what we've seen over time is um, digital banking being one of that key areas. So if we look at just the companies um, that are directly facing sort of personal consumers, um, the funding to those companies has, has taken off enormously, uh, jumping from just, just two billion in 2014 uh, to over six billion in 2015, and, and definitely not sort of slowing down. Um, and a large part of that is because of sort of the millennial segment. So there's a recent poll that said that you know 60% of all financial products are not uh, targeted at millennials, um, and so now what you see is sort of an opportunity for upstarts across. The, the landscape to sort of really um, form a UI and data-driven um, applications to target them in, in better ways. So we, we've seen that sort of borne out across these different areas, um, including crowdfunding, marketplace lenders, um, different payments apps, and, and now also into the insurance space where we're seeing um, different companies sort of build these new UIs and, and new sort of distribution platforms to, to target millennials. Um, here, just a quick look at some of those companies. Um, early stage, we're still seeing you know a, a number of activity at the early stage, um, but we are seeing a little plateau a little bit. Uh, 2015 saw uh, just one more deal than the 2014 in terms of early stage fintech. Um, although we are seeing continued amount of sort of big funding investments into the early stage activity, so 2015 um, surpassing sort of 2014's total. Um, here. Um, so now what we're going to see is sort of just some of the geographic trends. I'm going to brush through these very quickly um, around sort of the, the three main areas uh, within North America, Europe, and Asia. So here you see sort of the influx of funding to North America and fintech, uh, $7.7 .7 billion invested in venture-backed fintech companies in North America um, in 2015. You see some of the mega rounds there listed, but SoFi, Affirm, Credit Karma, among some of the companies that took in rounds over $100 million uh, in fintech uh, in 2015. Um, when we look at sort of the five quarter trend, though, you do see that sort of drop off in Q4. Um, you know, whether this will continue into 20, 2016 is sort of uncertain thus far. You know, we are seeing a steady amount of deals thus far into 2016, um, but whether we, we see some of those bigger mega rounds bear out will be definitely be of interest um, in fintech uh, as, we, as we think about what's going to happen in 2016. Um, when we look at sort of the later stage deal sizes, uh, you do see some that see that notable drop off between Q3 and Q4 from 75 million when we saw a lot of these sort of influx of mega rounds in Q3 uh, to just 38 million in Q4. Um, so it's a trend to keep aware of. You know, it's sort of coming back to earth in terms of some of these late stage activities that happened in fintech um, in Q3. When we look at sort of the deal share by stage, um, we are seeing sort of increase activity at the Series B or the mid-stage. So a lot of the companies that received early stage funding sort of graduate to sort of Series B and, and Series C funding. Um, so Series B deal share rose to a five quarter high in Q4. Um, at the same time, we did see sort of seed activity match a sort of five quarter low in Q4. So definitely something to keep in mind as we, as we think about sort of the early stage activity and trends heading into 2016. Um, CVC participation has been similar to what we saw globally in, in North America. So in Q4, we saw uh, one-fourth of all activity include a corporate or corporate venture arm. Uh, so North America sort of uh, mirroring what we see globally in terms of um, corporate activity into the fintech sector. Here I'm just going to take a quick look at some of the sort of major VC investors into fintech. Um, not surprisingly, a lot of the sort of multi-stage venture firms in Silicon Valley are actively investing across fintech, including Andreessen Horowitz, um, Coastal Ventures, Spark Capital, and others. And then you see some of the sort of more niche uh, firms who are, who are more fintech-focused, QED investors, blockchain capital, for example. Um, 
but here are just some of the names investing in sort of the fintech sector broadly. Uh, California, just quickly, you know, California and New York has been sort of the two main areas of fintech investment. And here you see sort of the trend over five quarters. Um, New York, um, actually much smaller than California from a dollar's perspective, um, but you see sort of the increasing amount of fintech uh, investment activity in New York over time. Next, I'm going to go through quickly through Europe and what we're seeing sort of in the European fintech sector. Um, so here you see sort of the five quarter trend to VC backed fintech funding. Um, for the second year in a row, we saw over a billion dollars invested into fintech companies in Europe, 1.47 billion invested um, in European fintech companies in 2015. Um, so, and you see sort of the, the uh, definitely the, the increase in deals, so over 120 deals um, to European fintech companies. Um, when we look at the five quarter trend, it's definitely more steady than what we're seeing in North America, and, and we'll touch on Asia later. Um, but the deal activity has been has, has been very steady across the five quarter trend in Europe, um, where we're seeing um, uh, a relatively steady amount of investment um, into fintech companies in Europe. So much different than where we saw a much bigger downturn in in, in Asia and also North America. Um, when we look at the deal share by stage, what's interesting is we're actually seeing. Um, a surge of early stage seed activity in Q4, which we saw rise to a five quarter high um, in Q4. So 40% uh, of, of deal share went to seed activity in Q4. Um, that was different from Q2, where we actually saw a number of uh, Series A investments into European fintech companies. So it's interesting to see sort of this shift um, where we're still seeing a healthy amount of seed activity in Europe. When we look at the sort of corporate trend, it, Europe actually is it's much different than what we've seen um, across Europe, uh, across North America and Asia. Um, actually, for four of the past five quarters, we saw less than 15% of uh, deal activity to VC-backed fintech companies include a corporate uh, or corporate venture arm in Europe. Um, you know, the reasons for that are are a bit unclear. I mean, there there are definitely European banks who are um, quite active in investing in, in fintech. Santander and Adventures is one. Um, BBVA, which was just recently sort of uh, shifted into sort of Propel Ventures is another, um, but we, we do see uh, less activity on the corporate front into European fintech companies um, than, than sort of the, the counterparts in North America and Asia. Whether that will change is sort of to be determined, but interesting trend that's borne out in the data. Um, here you'll see some of the major sort of uh, fintech investors in Europe, Index Ventures, Balderton Capital, Excel Partners, who uh, um, by and large, are sort of the most active investors in Europe overall, but we're seeing sort of other investors there. Anthemis Group, uh, one firm that's sort of very fintech focused, and you see a few others there um, who are investing uh, broadly throughout uh, sort of European fintech. Just to touch on sort of UK, um, UK definitely saw a high in 2015 in terms of uh, fintech funding, driven by a lot of the mega rounds. There, you see Funding Circle raised 150 million, World Remit on sort of the remittances side raised 100 million dollars. Um, and Adam Bank, which is uh, one of sort of this new group of challenger banks um, that has emerged in Europe, uh, raising $128 million, uh, largely from BBVA, which also acquired um, sort of a neobank in, in North America and Simple. Um, and here we'll, we'll just touch on that, that theme a little bit, but what you're seeing here is this sort of influx of funding to these new challenger and, and neobanks. Um, so Adam Bank and Starling both raising large rounds since the start of 2015, um, and you see sort of how that, that funding trend is bearing out between the number of these companies um, across Europe. Uh, BBVA, interesting, has is, is acquired both Simple and, Simple and Holby, um, and then with that big investment in Adam Bank. Uh, so here you see sort of just that, that breakdown of companies by disclosed funding. Germany, just quickly, um, definitely not the same level of sort of funding totals that we've seen in, in the UK, um, but an upward trend in terms of thin activity to venture-backed companies in Germany, um, and we're seeing that increase over time as well. So lastly, I'm just going to go through what we're seeing in Asia before we, we, we wrap it up with a Q&A. Um, Asia was interesting in that we really saw, you know, Asia have its fintech moment in 2015. So over $4.5 billion invested into Asian fintech in 2015. That's a notable step increase from what we saw in years prior, um, actually quadrupling the total that we saw in 2014. Um, interestingly, actually, Asia might have seen the largest drop-off in terms of um, funding activity uh, to in Q4, um, where, where we saw sort of you know these billion-dollar quarters in Q2 and Q3, and then sort of a large drop-off in Q4. Um, that's because you know a large portion of sort of fintech activity in Asia is driven by mega rounds that we saw in 2015. Um, 
you see here sort of the increase in early stage deal sizes over time. Uh, so, so early stage fintech deals in Asia continue to rise to, to new highs. Um, and when we look at the deal share uh, over over time in Asia, what we're seeing is that sort of deal share is now dropping. Um, actually, dropped to a five quarter low in in Q4 15. Um, and we're seeing sort of activity shift towards the mid-stage. What's interesting is these large rounds in Asia that are happening across the ecosystem are happening at, at all stages, um, and we're seeing an influx of capital deployed both um, in some of these more strategic deals and, and others. Um, Asia has also seen the largest amount of sort of corporate activity into the um, investment trends in fintech, so actually 40% uh, of all deals in uh, VC-backed fintech companies in Asia included a corporate or a corporate venture arm. This is sort of a, a step increase higher than what we're seeing in North America and certainly in Europe, um, and also a, a reason why we're seeing a lot of strategic investors, if you think about Alibaba, Tencent, and others in China who have really uh, tried to establish a foothold in financial services, also investing in, in some of the, the leading companies in, in China and, and in Asia as well. Here you'll see some of the most active venture investors in Asian fintech, um, a number of investors across China, Asia, as well as others. Um, Japan, you see Mitsubishi and, and some others there invested as well. Um, and China, it definitely, what's interesting is while, while we did see sort of a, a, a drop in, in deal activity uh, in 2015, the venture-backed companies in the space, we did see a sort of step increase in funding, so 2.6 billion deployed to VC-backed fintech companies in Asia. Um, Zongan Insurance, uh, uh, sort of one company in the sort of insurance space that is set to go go public, and, and I think they, they see an $8 billion valuation in China. Lu.com, another a big one um, there, and they, they took a, a sort of influx of capital as well in 2015. Um, when we look at India, um, we also saw, you know, enormous increase in funding to Indian fintech companies. Um, Two of the companies there focus on sort of marketplaces for financial services, Bank Bazaar and Policy Bazaar, was raised. And then 197, which has been raising sort of the majority of funding um, in Indian fintech, including uh, from Alibaba in China um, and others. Um, so here's sort of, you know, the, went through this very quickly. We'll get you the slides afterwards, but just want to go through some of the trends we're seeing on the investment landscape throughout uh, the North American, European, and Asian fintech hubs. Um, so with that, we're going to move to q and I know I think we have Joe on the call um, who will be able to answer some of your questions, and I'm happy to answer some of them as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to just leave it here. Here's our contact information for all of the sort of speakers who, who were on this webinar. Uh, I want to thank all of you guys for joining us today, um, and feel free to get in touch with any questions. So I'm looking here. Victor from the team has been um, sort of wrapping up with, uh, with a lot of the questions that you guys have been submitting. Um, you know, one question I see here is, what is where are sort of the early stage investments uh, going within insurance, uh, which is sort of a, what's been called sort of fintech's next frontier? Um, it's interesting. What we're seeing um, in insurance is a lot of the deal activity that initially happened in the health, sort of health insurance space um, with sort of the passage of ACA, uh, the Affordable Care Act, is now shifting to other lines. So I think when we look at the early stage activity, we're seeing a lot of um, startup formation in areas like small business, small medium business uh, insurance. We're seeing it in areas like renter's insurance. Um, and we're also seeing it in, in newer areas, um, including sort of companies who are building more um, sort of on-demand uh, insurance models uh, who are sort of, sort of unbundling policy times and coverage times. Um, so it's an exciting time. I think, you know, when we, when we talked about some of those seed rounds earlier, um, Lemonade is one company here in the U.S. which is trying to be a new sort of peer-to-peer -peer insurance carrier, and then uh, another one which just recently raised funding, Next Insurance, which was uh, founded by the former founders of uh, Check, uh, a bill pay app that was acquired by Intuit. Both of those sizable bets, um, and what we're seeing um, is, is, a, is a real sort of excitement around these different categories beyond sort of what we earlier saw in health insurance. Um, I do see a question here from Joe. Uh, for Joe on the blockchain side. Um, so Joe, I'm just going to cue you in here. The question here we see is, what's been the influence of blockchain in organizational aspects, and how does blockchain impact the future of work? Um, so Joe, I'm going to turn it over to you on that one. Um, so I, 
a, a slight joking aside first of all i think i think one of the, one of the impacts of blockchain on on organization is uh is a lot of people running around and obsessing about it um <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you and it, it does take up a disproportionate amount of people's time a lot of the questions that we actually get asked are from board level down should i be worried about this and and um, what does it mean for our organization and it, just like everything else in fintech is, uh, and talking about established companies now, um, uh, mainstream companies, then it, it, is this going to eat our lunch or fundamentally change things? Um, on on the other side of the equation, um, there is there's an interesting, there is a couple of interesting areas that people are exploring uh, at the moment. So you know, one of the areas we've been looking at ourselves as a as a partner organisation, partner based organisation, whether or not we we play around with the blockchain in terms of holding partner credentials, unique identity, uh, those kind of things. So so that's that's one of the uh, one of the areas that people are exploring. If if people are looking at digital identity in the outside world and they're looking at customer digital identity, uh, one of the questions is is should they be using it for staff digital identity? So that's an extension of that the, the point that I was making earlier. And um, and there are one or two early stage developments in in, in that area around privileges and permissioning um, for individuals within organisations, uh, but that's very early at this moment in time. Um, but and I'd say those are those are the key areas that we're seeing people play around with. Certainly in financial services, I'll keep my comments into the financial services space at the moment. Back to you, Matt. Um, we're gonna, we've seen definitely one more on the blockchain side of things for Joe here. Um, so Joe, if you want to answer this one, how might KYC add value for blockchain? Um, it's more a question of how blockchain can add value for KYC is the, is, is the question. So um, the it starts with digital identity and, and whether or not you... Um, so here's the problem statement. I'll, I'll explain the problem statement and then hopefully that people will see where uh, the technology could play. Um, so we have a, a situation in, in retail banking and in, in consumer banking generally where uh, governments guarantee deposits of, uh, of current account holders up to a value. In the UK, that's £75,000. Um, and that's great. It means that if uh, your bank fails, the, the government guarantees your money. Uh, the problem is one of continuity of service in, in the uh, if you don't have two bank accounts, and, and most people don't have more than one, then you need to be able to access that money the day after that bank fails. So, um, in those circumstances, uh, if you don't, if you can't passport people across with a unique digital identity, then it has to go through an account switching process very, very quickly. Uh, in most markets, that account switching process takes uh, a week or two weeks. Uh, or even longer if one bank fails and suddenly the system is uh, is eaten up or it exceeds capacity. So, so there are two solutions to that problem broadly. One is everybody has two bank accounts, which isn't going to happen because one might be active and one dormant. Uh, and the second scenario is that your details are held cent centrally with your balance as of last night. Uh, and, and the idea that uh, we've been playing around with with one company is uh, is whether or not you can hold that centrally, blockchain could be the means of holding it um, and take the you know the the basic identity of an individual uh, with their last account so they can access their funds at bank B if bank A fails uh, within 24 hours. Now, if you ex expand that into general need for porting with uh, customers of capital markets and investment banks or or any of those other areas, then you start to look at um, what the chain can actually hold uh, in, in terms of attributes, unique attributes, and can it be constantly updated. So in the consumer area, that might be county code judgments in the UK or, or whatever adjudications are taking place against the individual, uh, and therefore its credit history, or in, um, in more wholesale banking, corporate banking, then it may well be uh, you start with the legal entity identifier and then affiliates and subordinates are documented within uh, side chains or equivalent in those circumstances. 
So those, those are the kind of areas that we're exploring at the moment and we're seeing some significant interest in. Hopefully that answers the question. Back to you, Matt. Hey, Joe, I, I see one last question here on the blockchain, and it's a broad one, but um, what will be the role of government and how sort of blockchains can be developed as TCP, ICP was, um, if you want to tackle that last one? Uh, very, very good question. Um, and, you know, my the, the reference point I use for this is, is very much, it, if you take my last example there um, previously, which was about somebody having their um, consumer or current account deposits guaranteed by um, by government, then it starts to you start to look at other areas where if you you are going to hold digital identity centrally, where uh, where the government, if you will, um, can uh, can play. Uh, you start looking at passports. You you start looking at national health records or or centrally held health records or identities, um, and and. Then you come up in, into you run into an interesting area of, um, of data privacy and the trade-off between those two things. So on one hand, somebody might want continuity of service uh, and may demand that, but the trade-off of that is their identity being held centrally and, and probably in an area which is is potentially accessed by uh, accessible by government because it's going to be secured by government. It would have to be. Um, so so there's some interesting trade-offs. Philosophically, um, uh, ethically, morally, that um, that people are playing with in in those areas as it expands. The other the other example I would use, uh, a real example, is around things like chip and pin. So if you go back to the you know the first guys of chip and pin in the early 90s, the first country really to roll it out en masse was France, and it was government backed, and um, and that that was. You know, developed as a security issue and, and also an identity issue. Um, then the UK did it, but it was predominantly private sector. And eventually, and more recently, the US has rolled out chip with signature. Um, governments do have a role to play in those areas, and, and different governments play in, in, in a different way. Um, some are more state-sponsored, and, and some are more private sector-sponsored. So I think it will play out differently in different jurisdictions. Back to you, Matt. Great. So um, I'm just going to wrap up here with, uh, I know you guys have a lot of questions. We'll get to a lot of those um, later. And feel free to also send those over by email. Um, I do see one here. How soon, one, how soon might we start to see consolidation of fintech companies? Um, I think, you know, one thing that is interesting is we have seen, we have seen a fair number of, of, of acquisitions in the fintech space of, um, of sort of in the personal finance space, sort of of uh, companies that are facing consumers, so Check, LearnVest, and others. And I think what we're seeing is more of a willingness by large financial services firms to acquire. Um, Nasdaq, for example, made another acquisition today. Um, Goldman Sachs doing doing its first early stage uh, acquisition uh, last week, and then and then BlackRock also sort of making um, its first sort of splash in the fintech M and A space, acquiring Future Advisor. Um, so we anticipate more sort of big financial services forms to go the M&A route. Um, as some of these sort of fintech upstarts establish enough of a brand and, and uh, credibility around uh, a lot of the sort of consumer-facing areas, uh, and I think what we will see is, is more M&A over time and, and, and a lot of these incumbents who are even going earlier and, and acquiring these companies maybe one, two, three years after they've been formed um, rather than sort of large companies. Uh, who are at the very late stage or, or have already gone public. So um, that's, one, that's one thing that I do see happening over time. Um, I think with that, we're going to wrap up here. And I, I think we'll, we'll, we're going to get you guys the slides afterwards, um, the presentation, as well as a link to the FinTech Pulse report that we put out with KPMG last week, uh, the 2015 year interview where you saw the, a lot of the data come from. Um, but with that, I want to thank everyone for joining us today on the call. Um, on this Monday and um, have a great rest of the week.